Welcome to this uh, special webinar that we have today on e-gaming, the online gaming uh, platforms. Uh, I just want to begin by um, saying that if we look at the last uh, 90 days, especially while COVID, while, while COVID has been a tough time for the entire business community, but for the gaming industry, it has been a completely different story. The absence of live sports has given the e-gaming another boost. I, I'll just quote some numbers that are out in the public domain. For example, in India, in the last 90 days, uh, 90 plus days, we have seen 24% spike in traffic. That is huge. And currently, the e-gaming industry, the online gaming industry in India stands at $930 million and is expected to grow to $3.7 billion in the next four years, which is a massive growth. It is the sunrise sector. It's where the money is. So the future, if you want to leverage, if you want to play in this sector, I think there are three critical elements. One is the infrastructure part of it. Second is creating that seamless experience and also ensuring that India with, with its diversity is at rest with all its challenges that are there. So today we have a uh, we have a topic uh, that addresses all of these things. And the topic is new gen CDNs for online gaming. And I have a very esteemed panel in front of me. I would introduce uh, my panelists. I have with me uh, Rishabh Mathur, uh, founder and uh, CTO. Uh, sorry, just a minute. Uh, uh, nine stocks. Nine stocks. I have, uh, Sorry, nine stacks. I'm really sorry. Hello. Viral uh, Viral Mehta, VP Engineering Loco. Sanket Savakar, CEO of Sports Interactive. Siddharth Kedia, Group CEO Nordwin Gaming. Arjit Bhattacharya, Founder and CEO Virtual Infocom. Uh, Anurag Khurana, Esports Consultant, Paytm First Games. Mukta Aphale, who will be joining us uh, later. She's the VP Reliability Engineering Mobile Premier League. Uh, we have Manish Agarwal, CEO Nazara Technologies. Uh, we have Shiva Nandi, uh, CEO and founder Sky Esports. Anirudh Nagpal, CEO Ebullient Gaming India. Uh, Yash Pariani, CEO and founder Indian Gaming League. Uh, Anni Kate Sharma, who would uh, be joining us in place of Mr. Ashwin Rao, who couldn't join us. Uh, he had some important uh, assignment coming up, uh, some meeting coming, I'm sorry. Uh, Anni Kate is the India Strategic Account Manager for Limelight Networks. We also have Ernest Russell, who is the Technical Product Marketing Manager at Limelight Networks, and Charles Cross, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Limelight networks. Welcome, gentlemen, all of you to this uh, uh, conversation. Uh, I would first of all, uh, start uh, with you. Uh, uh, if I can start with you, Anirudh, you know, I'll come to you first. Uh, tell me, how do you see the impact of the last 90 days uh, on e-gaming? What has been your observation so far? So, thank you so much for having me on the panel. I think it's, it's a great opportunity. And also, it's a great time to uh, discuss about esports as as you rightly mentioned that it has grown uh, immensely in this in this particular three or four months. What I can show you are my experiences with one of our talents that we basically uh, manage. That is two side gamers who's a free fire uh, talent who, who basically plays a free fire game, and then this Dynamo who is primarily playing PUBG. In the, both of the cases uh, with two side gamers, they used to generate forty million views approximately for a particular month. Now they're right. generating approximately seventy one million views in a month which is a huge growth, approximately a percentage, which is more than 80% uh, up on, on, on the viewership, which is out there. The second thing with Dynamo also, he, is, right. he has grown immensely. He has now a subscriber base of 7.7 .7 million subscribers and is growing at a, at a rate, which is again, uh, at, a, at a percentage of approximately 70, 75%. So this is in a personal capacity of an individual creator. When it comes to the genres of the contents which are out there in gaming, they are growing at a very fast pace again, which is again a tournament culture, which is going on right now, which are the scrims which are happening, the practice matches. They, they have seen an enormous growth in numbers. 
So I'm pretty much sure that uh, the best people out there are sitting here can tell you about tell more about on the tournament side. And also, again, there are some other aspects of uh, casual gaming as well, which I think Anurag sir uh, will be mentioning you about, and then Manish sir also can help you out with it. I want to come to Mr. Khurana with the same question. Uh, what has been the learnings for e-gaming uh, players? And as I said in the, at the outset, that there is a spike with huge traffic uh, coming towards uh, e-gaming e e platforms. How are you leveraging it? Are you prepared uh, for dealing with this kind of a traffic hype? Uh, from our experience, we were not prepared. Uh, since IPL was coming, our focus was all on the fantasy uh, uh, part of our uh, platform. But with that getting uh, not happening, we immediately started the esports, and the response was tremendous. For the first tournament that we did for Clash Royale, we got uh, 11,000 uh, plus registrations. And the best part was out of that 11,000 people, actually 8,000 people came to play the tournament, which was a roughly three day tournament. And uh, that was our entry into esports. Then we thought that it was because of a fluke. So we launched another uh, three month uh, long tournament for Clash Royale, where we had another uh, 10,500 people registers. So that has been our journey. And trust me, we were not prepared for this. When we launched the uh, tournament, we just launched with 512 uh, players participating registering and maximum we had kept uh, 1000 uh, people registration, but those 500 registration just happened in half an hour. So we just ramped it up. We were like, okay, let's move it to 2000, 4000. Then finally, even uh, two hours before the registration was supposed to close, we closed it before because we had got 11,000. It was our first tournament. We were not sure how would we execute, but the response was tremendous. Right. Mr. Mathur, uh, tell me uh, from an infrastructure point of view, the e gaming architecture point of view, what has been kind of your observation? What needs to be done? In the, whatever you have learned from the last 90 days, uh, uh, how, how do you think people can uh, deal and you know, leverage this kind of a traffic flow that is coming their way? Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, rightly put, Rohel, I think uh, uh, architecture, architecture is, uh, you know, the basic architecture of your product is very important. And, uh, you know, the, the architecture should be such that you are able to uh, uh, scale up both breadth wise as well as you know depth wise so uh, in order to do that i mean um, we at nine stacks we basically uh, we have a microservices architecture so wherein uh, uh, each of these uh, microservices are uh, dockerized and uh, you know we use kubernetes to uh, 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 you know uh, to put uh, basically to containerize all of these this basically helps us to, you know, in, 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 you know, however unfortunate this uh, COVID situation was, we did see 300 percent, you know, uh, rise in our registrations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there were 300. I mean, uh, if we were uh, looking at uh, 40,000 users, active users a month, we that rose to, you know, uh, uh, 3x uh, in one of the months, right. and uh, you can you can never be prepared for such, you know, such uh, scenarios. So. Uh, uh, and absolutely, I mean, uh, Anurag, I mean, you're absolutely right. Nobody can be prepared for such scenarios. It's, uh, it's, it's going to, it's insane if you're prepared. But um, I mean, if the architecture is built in such a way that, you know, you're, you're able to scale up uh, easily, that really helps. And um, in this COVID situation, it, it did help us a lot. Mr. Mehta, I want to understand the local story of dealing with this uh, uh, the experience of last uh, days and overall, you know, uh, what do you think, how is the landscape shaping up a little bit of that and plus the last uh, 90 days developments, if you could. Um, so we, we launched the, the latest incarnation of Loco, which is Loco Game Streaming uh, on 1st of April. So we launched during COVID. And, uh, and so we have been building up features and, uh, and seeing a tremendous growth in terms of numbers that we are seeing. Um, our initial focus was obviously in, a, in any two-sided platform is to kind of secure the, the supply side, so secure people who want to stream. So we sent out a form, just to give you some sense of the interest in this space as well. We sent out a form saying, hey, why don't you just give us your phone number, email, name, what game would you like to stream? And just put a link on the app. 
Right. So then we over over a week we'll get like 500 600 responses. Within a week or two weeks we got 30,000 responses. That's massive. I deduced all of them. We it, it deduced it was like 24,000. So it is just mind blowing the amount of uh, uh, response we are getting. And and uh, as uh, Rishab said, the only way to scale is to make sure that your architecture is designed to be horizontally scaled. Um, you have to be able to have an architecture where you can just throw more boxes at it and it'll just take more people and just take out boxes when, <clears throat> if and when your traffic goes down and be able to manage that. Otherwise you'll be, otherwise you are massively over engineering. If you're able to, able to serve it and if you're not able to serve it, then, then that's just the worst possible situation to be in. Um, so there is tremendous interest in this space and, uh, and and that's that's our journey so far, right. and uh, it is it is we have a similar system. We don't use uh, containers, but we use uh, the straight EC2 instances and services like that, and we scale like that. So. Right, right. Okay. So I have two announcements to make. One is that uh, we are taking questions. We are live on Facebook and other social media platforms. You can post your questions there or send us here on the Zoom uh, app. Also, we, I want to request my speakers to limit themselves to two minutes. So we have a lot of questions coming, so we can address all of them. So I want to come to you, Mr. Uh, uh, Saukar. Um, uh, give me your, your, your side of the story, your learnings from the last 90 days. Sure. So, I mean, I think everyone uh, definitely believes that COVID's been an unprecedented situation. And especially for... Uh, for the gaming industry. And uh, there are a lot of things that uh, people had to pivot to. Uh, and again, there are two sides of the story. On one side, you have you know the fantasy sports platforms, which have taken a major hit because of lack mm -hmm. of uh, sporting action, all the events being canceled or postponed. Uh, and they try to supplement that with other minor tournaments, but it's not the same thing. However, you know, with Europe, parts of Europe opening up, especially football resuming, things should start looking, uh, start to look better. But on the other hand, the online gaming platforms that host, you know, the likes of Rami, Teen Patti, uh, Poker, Ludo, Quiz, and other skill-based games have seen a massive surge in traffic. And, you know, the numbers that you stated, uh, close to 23-24% growth is, is, is actually phenomenal. And what are people doing? People are, you know, turning up onto the, on, on these platforms for, for seeking simple entertainment and social connect. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much been the story. Right. Mr. Kedia, if you can hear me, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yeah. So, uh, Nautilus has been doing a lot of work in e-gaming and been there for some time. Tell me your learnings. Uh, where does the next phase of uh, growth come from? You know, just want to understand your perspectives. So you know, <clears throat> uh, by the way, just to uh, just to be a little bit of a puritan, it. I, it's e-sports or gaming. E-gaming is kind of a misnomer. Uh, but having said that, I think the, the two things that we are seeing is, one is the cultural context, right? So right. we have seen that cultural context shift in the last three months from parents telling kids, don't play a game, it is not good for you, to now joining them and playing with them. And that's a massive, massive shift. Right, so you have to understand that's like a tectonic shift, which which happens once in a while in any industry, and it's happening in gaming right now. The second thing which is happening is we are seeing a massive shift in terms of people who are willing to compete, who want to aspire to be professionals in the world of gaming, and that's where esports really comes in. To give you an example, we run, uh, you know, we run our national championship called India Premiership. And it runs for about nine months of the year. And we are in the summer season right now. So when we started the registrations this year, we were reporting and we were feeling happy every few days. We said 100% increase from last season, 200% increase. At about 400% increase, we stopped talking increase in percentage. And now at the end of the registration for this season, we have seen a 19x increase. So where the number was 3000 in last summer, it's about, it's sitting at 57,000 people wanting to compete and play professionally. So that's happening on the watch platform, on the view, on, on the compete platform, on the watch platform, 
again we are seeing massive surge right so we have seen surges to the to the tune of 1.2 million concurrent views on youtube and that is no mean feat for esports to achieve those are regular you know cricket used to talk about those numbers of course now cricket has gone a little ahead but a few years back cricket was talking about those yeah so i think that the two things that will happen is that in the post covid world as we are calling it would there be a little decrease in the number of people who are gaming yes will that be significant no because people have now got used to a new form of entertainment they are going to play more games it is more interactive all other forms of entertainment thus far were passive this is the only mm. active form of entertainment both competing playing watching all of those right, right. so i think the shift that is hap- that is going to happen according to me post covid right. is that we are going to see increasing interest in both playing games for fun and competitively and watching others play competitively and there's going to be a significant shift in that right right anyway i mean there, there's not a fixed format to this conversation anybody wants to rebut or put in his view points while somebody has a, is you know speaking is we have that format as well um i want to go to uh, mr patacharya and asked that uh, we uh, mr kedia spoke about that behavioral shift you know how that cultural shift is happening um give me a little sense are you do you agree with this uh, and what does it mean for uh, the industry the esports industry super well uh, it's a beautiful discussion actually that's happening honestly speaking when you look at uh, the entire population of india we have three different segment one is the kids who are playing games second segment is the parents who are right now engaged with these kids to play games and the third segment is the people who are aged above 50 55 60s so they are maybe grandparents of those kids so when you look at the industry um, according to my understanding india saw a lot of those uh, over 50 people they are downloading their games into their smartphone and engaging themselves with those kind of play and movements and all not only that i have got a few of the reports from uh, those uh, old age home those guys who are aged above 70 75 plus who actually right. downloaded a lot of casual game i mean they don't understand the esports of course but they are inclined into the casual games they are going for those kind of play modes and making friends so what happened in a way is just a interaction with these guys with maybe some kid whose age is about 12 or 14 and they are interacting using the game as a media so mm-hmm. i believe personally post covid 19 if you look at that world those connection mm-hmm. cannot be destroyed the bond already happened for the last you know 60 90 days so a person who is like sitting alone at home who don't have anyone to talk with they got beautiful friends overnight and they are interacting they are communicating i feel it's not about gaming it's about more personalized experience for people and that's right. going to stay and that's going to continue for i think next 5 6 years minimum until unless we have uh, some other wave which is coming up and changing everything sure sure that's going to stay just to add okay. there uh, royal i think uh, see he's 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 right in saying that Uh, we 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 are seeing a shift in user behavior here right we are seeing a shift in user behavior now uh, now online basically a screen time has uh, risen considerably right and now online is the place to hang out because the usual yeah. places to hang out they are missing and uh, you know uh, for us uh, at nine star we, we saw a huge surge in you know requests for private tables and private tournaments so that people can play with their own friends instead of you know the regular uh, table so that there was a huge surge so much so that i mean uh, i mean uh, this is what we are going to do now in you know in the next set of innovations uh, we we have to retain these users right we have to retain this this user behavior is not going to change now so we have to we have to cash on this uh, user behavior um, and you right. know that's what right right uh, mr agarwal uh, Uh, i want to understand you uh, from you the learnings of the last 3 uh, months everybody has you know kind of different perspectives w- what do you think have been the value adds for the esports community in the last 90 days i think uh, in 3 months a lot of siddharth and everybody has spoken about i think the beauty is that 
esports is mainstream. Uh, Brilliant. That's right. E four M doing a limelight conference on esports uh, mm -hmm. means that uh, you want to push. <laughs> You want to push streaming of the esports, huh? Yeah. So you want to push this to your brands, and for all of us, honestly, uh, ecosystem needs more money in esports. Uh, it's like good old days of cricket, when the money came into the business. Uh, you you saw more and more aspirational among players to compete, compete for the highest standards, and that had a direct correlation to more eyeballs and. Uh, a virtuous cycle got created. I think uh, the same virtuous cycle hopefully will get created um, in esports. To me, that is the this is the beginning of the outcome uh, which COVID has done. And with lots of journalists talking about esports, uh, more such webinars happening on esports. I think um, a lesser job people like me have to do about evangelizing esports. So I'm very happy um, that now the chorus is increasing um, and more and more groundswell will happen and esports will be mainstream. Uh, right. and maybe maybe in three, four, five years time, this is really going to disrupt uh, the mm -hmm. whole sports ecosystem. And uh, that is what I believe the power right. of uh, virtual games is that you have... Uh, it's it's being played, it's being competed, and it's being watched on the device, which is with you 24 hours. And I think that's the beauty of it. And I, uh, the added element which really happens is the community part of it. The moment you add community to it, the more stickiness and more engagement happens. So I think esports is mainstream is the main outcome of this. Uh, I'll Perfect. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Nandi, I want to uh, understand that. Uh, we speak about the mainstreaming and do you think uh, this push was needed? I mean, at COVID in a way became, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know, should I use the word, certain kind of a blessing for the community, for the East gaming community, you know, it needed that push, you know, and it got it. Do you think uh, now it is here, it has arrived? Do you think so? Yeah, uh, of course, we need a, a certain kind of push for esports community as of now, and this is the right time uh, for the community to push uh, to the next level. Uh, this is the right time, actually. So, since we did a tournament uh, last two months, it was happened around 60 days. The push right. was, uh, it was insane. We didn't expect it, that kind of numbers, and that, that makes us to do a lot of things for the community and for the uh, people. Okay, right. so that tournament we have associated with the local and uh, uh, we did uh, PUBG Mobile, Brawl Stars, Class of Clans and Rainbow Six. But uh, PUBG Mobile, yes, it will do uh, good in, in terms of numbers. But what we were surprised is Brawl Stars and Class of Clans, Rainbow Six did amazing right. numbers in terms of participation, in terms of uh, uh, watch minutes and everything. So the community is loving, all the communities became very active. So now going forward, this kind of things has to be uh, leveraged to the next level in the esport team. Right. Mr. Nathpal, uh, is it the absence of live sports that is giving uh, distraction or it is genuinely also going to stay here? Your thoughts? So you know what I feel is that uh, as everybody is saying that esports is now mainstream, what we have observed is that since the time that we have been into it since 2017, we have been seeming, see, seeing that uh, it was tending towards mainstream forever. Now, it has been a massive explosion of mainstreamness towards esports. But it was tending towards this. For example, if I tell you, uh, since 2018, there have been collaborations with the artists who are from the West. That is Alan Walker, for example, is a very renowned DJ. So when he launched this song in PUBG, he collaborated with four of the Indian uh, PUBG players that happened in, 2000, in the early 2019s. Uh, right. Then from that particular part uh, to moving towards uh, the best kind of people who are in, in terms of growth coming into the picture with the with the athletes which are right now there who had observed a tremendous growth from 100,000 to a million in a very short 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 span that happened in esports again. Then again, if we talk about there was the first collaboration which cricket and esports saw 
was again in 2019 for IPL itself. So KKR collaborated with one of our talents who was at that time, Gary Minati. They collaborated on, on, a, on by playing FIFA. So we were, and uh, we had posted this particular picture saying that esports is now mainstream. So that happened into the early 2019s. Now is the time that people are starting to observe the multiple aspects of business in it. And there are plenty now. Now it has diverged itself into roots, into segments, which are now being seen as a profitable, profitable aspect for many companies which are MNCs and have come and seen some uh, growth in their business. There's one more right. aspect to it, which is that when you talk about esports as a structure, it was consumed as a content, but as an organization, as a structure, it is yet to grow. When I talk about this structure, I talk about the tournament sector, which is still growing in terms of infrastructure, in terms of standard, like how we see cricket right now, we don't see any of the tournaments that are happening. Yes, the, uh, the tournament companies are upping their game and people are absolutely fascinated by it. And uh, with the likes of Nordwin, Platonia, that's like coming up in the picture and picking these things up. And also there are some eSport organizations who have recently invested. So when it comes to uh, eSport coming in mainstream, I think it's, it was mainstream already. It is now getting structurized and organized. And also the business aspect of the economic sense of it is growing. That is what it is all about from now onwards. It is mainstream Perfect. from the from, from last uh, 365 days, I guess. So you think it was all okay. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Perspective. Yeah. So Mr. Uh, I want to go to Mr. Uh, Pariyani. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, tell me, what, is, what are your learnings from the last 90 days? What were the challenging parts of this, these uh, last 90 days for you? So I think we know, everyone has we mentioned. We know the traffic has surged, but what yeah. were the challenges that you faced? Yes. So twice we've had to upgrade our server uh, due to traffic and reaching peaks. We were hosting our website on AWS and we've had mm -hmm. to upgrade our package twice in the last three months. We kept thinking that, okay, this should last us good for the next three or four months, but it kept hitting in a new month. So mm -hmm. I think those were a couple of obstacles, uh, increasing our tech support uh, mm -hmm. and, and doubling our tournaments. So I think in March, we were averaging about 150 tournaments a month. Currently, mm -hmm. we're at uh, 280 to 300 tournaments a month. Mm -hmm. So we, and we're still keeping that track despite the unlock happening. So we're ensuring that we're keeping the users engaged as well. Okay. Mr. Russell, I want to come to you. Um, I mean, you have heard all the uh, esteemed speakers and uh, mainstreaming high is the new, uh, is, is, is a bright future. All of those points have come around and uh, somebody also said that tech, there was a challenge of tech there. Tell me uh, from a tech perspective, how do you see the last 90 days and uh, what are your observations? Um, I I, I'm seeing the same things um, when how I like to think about it is is not necessarily a change, um, but an amplification. Right. Because um, our our kids, our workers, um, even our grandparents, right, have mm -hmm. have more time to spend mm -hmm. um, at home, more time to spend um, playing games. And, you know, I know even locally here, I have I have sons, I have kids and, you know, they've been able to to play more, enjoy more. Right. And so um, from a, a technology um, perspective, um, it's, it's something that we're seeing on both sides um, from a CDN standpoint. We, we're seeing and, and Charlie will talk to you a little bit about this later, um, is that we're seeing a large increase of not just in, in video games, but in the delivery of video. Right. And and we're it's good that we're um, in a limelight being the CDN company, um, we're, we're really in a space where we were prepared to help because we were used to um, delivering um, large files, um, large quantity of files and high quality files. And that's, you know, that's one of the things that you need um, to, to deliver a good video gaming experience. Right. Mr. Sharma, I want to quickly come to you before I go to Mr. Cross. So your quick thoughts on this. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this was unprecedented. And uh, the fact that all technology partners to the gaming workflow have to scale up to that, the fact that the industry has been able to do it and uh, the panelists here uh, would add their views if they've had a success story with that. But so far, what we're hearing is that it, it has gone in the right direction, which means uh, although this was unprecedented, the tech partners uh, that the industry typically chooses to work with the top companies uh, have built robust systems 
and are able to scale up on, on a moment's notice to serve this. Right. Mr. Cross, finally to you, this is uh, with this question round, uh, your thoughts on the entire, uh, what people have spoken before you and what are your observations? Uh, what do you think uh, uh, can happen in the e-gaming space, you know, e-sport, so that it goes to the next level? What are your observations? You're on mute, Charlie. Sure. Yes. Sorry, can you hear me? Charles, you're on mute, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yes, yes. Please uh, unmute. You to unmute so. Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so um, I don't want to give spoilers to the data I'll show later, but let me say that uh, looking at the data across the 10 regions that we did the survey, by far the... Uh, the, the volume of game playing coming out of India for all types of game is far above any other country in, on the planet, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, esports we saw from other surveys already in what I call millennials, younger, already esports were bigger than watching traditional sports for them even before this. But as somebody mentioned, this has been an amplification. So having the pandemic and eliminating physical sports has just amplified the use of esports tremendously. So, um, because India, the, everybody in India plays all of these different types of games. It's not just certain games, but it's really across. The board. I think people all over the world will watch what happens in India in terms of scaling up and how this is working through society because you're, you're taking the lead in the world in, in almost all of this, the cultural aspects, the, uh, numbers of people playing, the issues of scaling, it's all happening to you a little bit sooner than everybody else. So you, you're, you'll, every, the, the eyes are on you to take the lead and show everybody the way. Right, right. Perfect. I think uh, we have uh, understood. Will, can I add something? Yes, please, please, please. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I have seen, at least, uh, I'm shifting a little bit from esports or gaming to a complete different dimension. Uh, mm -hmm. It's relevant, actually. Uh, so I have been raising fund for uh, one of the project based out of Australia, which is uh, making the aircraft engines, right? So while making their deck, the amount of money they are investing, along with that, I brought in one company based out of Ukraine who are mainly specialized into XR and how to make engines in XR beforehand to have an experience into it. They are integrating the whole thing and started raising money. It never happened before. So people understood that this is the only way where they can do the collaborative approach. They can use the net, they can use the network, collaborate with other engineers, do the project all together, and then take it forward. So industry started realizing the fact that post COVID-19, before everything becomes normal, they have to work and take it forward. And for that, they need these kind of small, small integration. Earlier, it was like a hard pitch. Like you need to pitch a lot to make them understand why you need this kind of gamified solution. But now people are upgrading themselves. The whole industry understands that yes, we need these kind of segment. Maybe game technology can be utilized in industry. It can be on a mainstream gaming. It can go after a casual genre. It can go serious. It can go esports. But yes, the industry is going to see a huge hype. It's going to stay. I believe it's going to stay. Perfect. Uh, I want to come to you, Mr. Kurana. Uh, we spoke about, you know, we have learnings and everything else. But uh, now there's another expectation from people who are in this space, which is providing a seamless experience. You know, I think that is the next big conversation. And as somebody rightly said that, you know, brands are also looking for, you know, in the absence of live sports, you know, there's a certain kind of mainstreaming happening and brands might actually start sponsoring you know, there might be a different uh, world altogether tell me how to when the seamless experience when we talk about it uh, how important do cdns i mean what role do you see uh, for them in in the next you know the next stage of uh, esports or online gaming whatever you call it you know what is the role they are going to play? How critical is that element going to be? I think uh, 
I'm not a technical guy, but whatever I understand of uh, CDM infrastructure, I think for delivery of uh, the video content, the streaming part, that is that definitely requires great CDN uh, services like Limelight uh, and others. So that is where CDNs will play a much more important role than just doing esports tournament because participation is not in couple of millions uh, for uh, tournaments, but viewership is in uh, millions. So right. according to me, we need great CDN infrastructure and uh, platforms like Limelight to basically deliver that experience, seamless experience to the viewers. That's, that's my take on CDN's uh, requirement. I, I'm sure everybody on this panel knows and understands what CDNs do, but just for the benefit of uh, the listeners out there, yeah. like CDNs are like the private told highways of the internet that get you get your information across the internet way faster than your regular internet traffic travels and without cdns none of the modern services that we are just used to and expect to work netflix amazon prime uh, hotstar z for any any online service they just simply would not work so uh, absolutely yes i think are yeah. absolutely crucial um, so, uh, I, I want to I want to come to you only, Mr. Mehta, in my, this, with the same question that uh, uh, are we uh, are is our industry in India, for example, the gaming industry, is it equipped to deal with the next phase of growth that we are expecting that we think will sustain, you know, after this COVID? In terms of tech, what absolutely. needs to be added to be changed? What is your suggestion? Uh, as far as the tech goes, uh, we are, as a country, as a infrastructure, we are 100% equipped to handle all of these goals. Um, mm -hmm. It's not even a question. And, uh, and no small credit to companies like Limelight, Akamai, AWS, Google, all of these guys were made computing and scaling computing a commodity for, the, for us. And that is amazing. It's incredible amounts of work, but that's amazing for us. So we can just say, I want, I want to triple my servers. All I need to do is click a few buttons and I have three X the servers. Right? Same thing with line that, Hey buddy, I need to three X my bandwidth for the next two days. So like, okay, done. That's all I need to do. There is nothing else required. You roll back the tie 20 years, you'd have to buy infrastructure. Right. So, so that we are completely equipped. What we really need is uh, support from, from the advertisers. So right now, esports and all of that is a very, very young audience. Mm -hmm. And the young audience, as uh, Charles put it, the millennials, millennials or the children of millennials are actually consuming and playing these games. And those will very soon be uh, the most difficult audience that brands actually want to reach. And so this is one of the ways to do it. And so we really need support and uh, recognition that esports truly is a grown up, formal, smart, mature industry that can actually deliver the goods and, and, and not just leave us as like, oh, 5% digital innovation marketing budget stuff. No, I, I like to add to that as well, uh, to Vidal's point that, you know, what we have observed in the past approximately one and a half years that uh, brands do have interest in it. Um, how we have seen that is with the campaigns that we have done, they have sold out the products that we have endorsed with the recent campaign that we had done with HP, it sold out the laptops with the recent, uh, project with the AMD that we had done, uh, sold out the products, which were out there in huge numbers. And then again, there are, uh, the applications which are out there, like probably like MPL or, or probably like, uh, any software based applications and also Paytm is kind of investing in, in games to also know that the kind of track that is involved right now is huge. All we need to do is... Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, we just lost your connection. Uh, okay. Uh, let me, let me uh, go to Mr. Kedia uh, uh, again. Um, uh, if you can hear me, sir. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, tell me, what are your observations uh, as far as the tech side uh, 
and uh, creating the next uh, experience in, in gaming, online gaming is concerned. What are your observations? Are we prepared? Uh, do we have enough of that, uh, you know, infrastructure, digital infrastructure to make it possible in a diverse market like India, where, for example, in a uh, you know, tier two, tier three cities, there is a broadband issue, there are multiple issues. What is your observation? So I think you've hit the nail on the head, right? So while I agree with uh, Viral for everything that he said, it's just, now the good news is India is a mobile first country. So while we started out on PC in the esports space, console was kind of non-existent and PC is building and PC is improving, but India continues to be a mobile first country. And for mobile first country, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's gaming or it's esports, one needs to have the cloud infrastructure right up there. Now, if you look at cloud infrastructure, the infrastructure which is being used is the AWS's, the Azure's, the Google Cloud. Now that's the cloud which is used. Where you have issues is where the telecom operators don't have the best bandwidth. And if you look back two years or three years versus today, that has significantly improved. Like I don't even want to get into the numbers of how significantly it has improved, but that has significantly improved. Are there some pockets that are remaining that still have intermittent uh, bandwidth issues? Yes. Are we on the, is every telecom operator looking at improving those pockets and, and aligning those pockets at par with the rest of the country? The answer is yes. So I think we are very, very well positioned from an infrastructure standpoint. Like Viral said, be it Limelight, uh, be it Akamai, uh, in collaboration with all the telecom operators, we are only get becoming bigger and better by the day. And I think COVID has, has accelerated that entire pace by three, you know, what would have happened in the next two to three years has happened in two months. Does that mean that every single infrastructure provider out there would be looking at saying, okay, now how can I make some of these markets where, where some of these issues persist as my key priority? I would tend to say every single infrastructure operator is looking at that right now. So I think we are very, very well placed to, to get to play the future where, you know, broadband uh, and technologies and CDNs are going to play a very critical role. Because if you see the two industries that have right. been on a gallop ever since uh, COVID has started is the video OTT and the gaming industry. And both of them are heavily dependent on CDN infrastructure. Absolutely, absolutely. Mr. Saukar, uh, the same question to you. Uh, from a tech and uh, infrastructure uh, point of view, you know, digital structure, infrastructure, what are your observations? Where is the next level needed? Where are the challenges? Yeah, and uh... I think a lot of people have alluded to the fact that uh, from a capability perspective, uh, India is right out there. And what has made that possible is the democratization of technology that these platforms and everybody has spoken about them, the AWSs of the world, the Azure's of the world. Hmm. And uh, that's just meant that you're able to do a lot more with, you know, a, you know, with a lot of efficiency. Uh, right. And again, the, the future is going to be with a lot of, ultra low latency systems that people would need to architect. Uh, mm -hmm. A combination of uh, technology choices across the CDN, because there are some problems that the CDNs may still not be able to solve, because not everything is booted through the CDN. And there'll be yes. some decisions that have to be taken on the cloud. So it's a, it's a mix of technology sets that will come together, weighing the pros and cons and uh, you know delivering the solutions of the future. But- Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, before I come to Mr. Bhattacharya, I just want to request all the speakers to mute their microphones, you know, and unmute it once you're speaking so that, you know, there's um, clarity in audio. Also to all the viewers that we are live on Facebook and you can post your questions on Facebook, you can send us on Zoom. We are getting a lot of questions and we'll keep the last 10 minutes for it. Mr. Bhattacharya, your thoughts on the gaps in, in, in the digital infrastructure as far as gaming is concerned? Well, uh, if you are asking me this question, it has got a two different aspects. One is from the company who is providing the service and the user base and the consumer. If I look at India, to be very honest, if you leave the four or five metro cities, if you go beyond that, if you go deep into the players who are mainly playing from suburbs, 
there is a huge gap till date in India regarding network connectivity. So it's not about only gaming, it's about working from home as well. If you want to put your employees who are maybe from some distance village and they want to work from home, we don't have that kind of infrastructure. When you go deep into the uh, you know, player's experience, as a player, if I'm playing a game and I'm playing an online game with multiple different friends of mine, and uh, somehow in between, you don't have the internet connectivity or somehow your network is off, as a player, you feel really disappointed. And if it continues, it's not very healthy for the ecosystem. And to be very honest, if you look at the esports industry, I think we have got more than 40 to 45 percent players who are not from those five metro cities. So players mm -hmm. are there who are actually trying to engage themselves, learn a little bit, communicate, and as I'm saying, get those personalized experience, be in the mainstream. I guess we lack a lot on that front. So we need an infrastructure for those guys who are looking for engagement level, learn a little bit. Esports is not about, as my personal feeling, it's not about only play. When you play a game, when you play any game in this, this genre, maybe, uh, maybe hack and slash or maybe a cricket kind of game, whatever, or fantasy sports, it is actually increasing your IQ level. So it is actually increasing your speed level. It is actually increasing your thought process. It is improvising your, your thinking uh, criteria. So let me take right. example of my kid. So he's about uh, 12 and he started learning this, this three uh, months period. He used to play games. Now he got a understanding. If I'm playing games, I should create games. I should understand the coding part of it. And I believe it is happening in multiple different areas in India. People are more inclined. And uh, um, I would love to ask my co-panelists, like we have a huge gap in India regarding game coders, game artists, and people are inclined to be into this, you know, this, this industry. And when you talk about playing games and from playing games, if you can convert those players into game makers, I think that's one of the best way because they know the experience, they know how you love to play something, how you are engaging with something. And I guess we should more look into those network issues, those, those electricity uh, connectivity problems, rather than only, uh, only thinking that, okay, fine, we have got great infrastructure in India. I feel there's a gap till date that's happening. In fact, I would love to touch upon, let me um, take a little bit uh, from the previous time. I, I am actually, I can see that there are local movie makers like Film Production House. They are converting their movie making process into complete different way. They, are, they have started using tools to create home-based movies, which is a you know, beautiful content. And these guys are coming up with their own OTT platform. So certainly the okay. will happen in your CDN. Oh, no, I will, I, will, I will touch upon those points and I'll, I'll come again. And uh, I just want to go to Mr. Dandy right now with his thoughts about creating the seamless uh, experience that we're talking about. You know? how, how do we make sure it stays the next level you know, is there? Yeah, so the thing is um, when we are broadcasting uh, a lot of contents, a lot of uh, a multi-language at the same time, uh, in our experience, I'll tell. So we are facing a lot of bandwidth issues and a lot of uh, uh, internet issues while casting and broadcasting uh, multiple languages. So that uh, we have chosen uh, um, uh, cloud server technology to to have a seamless uh, um, uh, productions for the broadcasting. So uh, going forward, so the bandwidth and uh, the server uh, cloud server technology has to be more precise and more. Uh, improve so that uh, we can have a seamless uh, uh, broadcasting. So right now we are facing a lot of problems on the broadcasting so that uh, we have chosen the cloud technology, but going forward, we have to go on. Right. Mr. Mathur, your quick thoughts on this. Sorry, our audio is muted. See, Siddharth already, uh, I mean, uh, rightly said that we are a mobile, mobile first nation, right? Being a mobile first nation, the first thing, the, the, the biggest you know, a uh, challenge that all of us must be facing is to, to, to keep our applications highly available to the users. Right. 
and in order to keep those keep, keep the application highly available there is only so much that you can do uh, you know from the front end optimizations minifications uh, uh, you know certain uh, compressions or image optim op optimizations the other thing that you can go to, you know go towards is of course uh, cdns so these are the these are the two things that you know that can make uh, 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 your application highly available apart from mm -hmm. that i mean touching upon uh, what uh, arjit said uh, see tier 2 tier 3 cities are now important mm -hmm. i mean we see a bulk of our revenues coming from there as well so mm -hmm. the other thing that we need to figure out is localization right so how do you mm -hmm. localize your uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, application so that the best user experience can be given to those uh, you know type of users uh, right. Right. that's that's um, okay. the Mr. Pariyani, I want to come to you with this, uh, your thoughts on the role of uh, you know, CDNs, the newer CDNs in creating this experience. What are your thoughts on this? So it's definitely helped in, uh, in giving uh, rural network areas more connectivity. And uh, right. that's definitely helped with the traffic. And we've definitely seen a huge in e growth in the tier two and tier three cities, not just in the tier one cities, as everyone has mentioned as well. And mm -hmm. I think that's all uh, related to the CDNs and having, you know, users being able to have access to these mobile networks now and being able to operate and play those games and have, you know, being able to log on. Right. So that's basically it. Okay. Mr. Agarwal, your thoughts, uh, the tech side, how do you see that seamless experience becoming even more, uh, you know, what do you call smooth, for example, because live sports is not there. People have much more ex expectations from the gaming platforms than they had before, if I'm right. Do you, do you think uh, we are prepared for creating the next level of experience? See, I think uh, tech is, uh, is enabler. And today the technology is not a limitation. It's your imagination which is limitation and what you want to do and what you want to deliver. So I don't yes. believe that uh, the question about whether, how will we manage, what will happen, will tech be able to deliver, I think those are all not the questions, not the problems which we are really looking to solve. Uh, there is enough and more uh, cap capability and capacity uh, in the both intellect side as well as in the execution side, which is available for somebody to create highly scalable business model in the space of esports or in the space of live streaming. So I think uh, the question itself is 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 not a question. Right. So so you are saying that we have the capability, but the uh, mood point is that are we do we have the uh, adjustment? You know, do we have time to quickly adjust? I mean, how do we respond to this demand quickly? I think and today, make sure. to, today it's everybody. It's elastic, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that I, I think Rishab said or somebody said that it's not that you're buying hardware and you're trying to take some, some go downs and then put your server farms and then try to put that iron in it and then try to, no, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, fundamentally the, how do we, the, 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 what, what every company would need to really figure out is right. that how do we really harness and build experiences uh, which are really going to work on mobile networks. Uh, they are going to work on varying mobile networks. They're going to work on, on uh, Wi-Fi, which is very, very strong versus, uh, uh, versus the yes, small the mobile, town. Yeah. Just the mobile network sucks everywhere. Uh, uh, it's not a limited problem on the small town or the big town. There are, pocket, yes. there are pockets where it goes down. So how does, how does really ensure a consistency of experience? How does one ensure that that, that uh, your product really is understanding of the Indian needs and whether it's Limelight or AWS or anyone, how does we really adapt to the infrastructure conditions in India and really create those experiences in line with the, with the CTOs? I think that's the important part. Uh, the, the capacity of servers is very highly scalable and elastic. So I, I don't think that's an issue. Right. Uh, Mr. Uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Nagpal, I want to come to you. Uh, Nagol, sorry. Uh, I want to have your thoughts on this. So sorry, your audio is muted. Uh, 
sorry, I can't. Okay. Uh, uh, while while you're connecting, let me uh, put this question to uh, Mr. Sharma. Your quick thoughts on it. We have heard that you know people want uh, networks that can that can be agile and that can be you know from a strong Wi-Fi to a mobile network that is like you know that goes up and down in in a, in an urban center. Also, there are pockets where you don't get, you don't get the network. How do you ensure that you know you create that? tech side of it, uh, which will be seamless even in such situations? I think, uh, well, the solution is not at one point. There are too many things that go into it. There are some uh, gaming uh, scenarios where latency is the most important. Those are places where multiplayer players are responding to each other in real time. And that's where latency plays a real, real critical uh, space. And there's some games where it just does not, uh, it's not very critical. The question is, uh, there's nothing that a CDN per se would do about the last mile uh, directly. Uh, there are things that the optimizations that are done uh, indirectly to improve that. And obviously Charles uh, will talk more on that. Uh, though the, the, this peering that uh, a CDN does with telcos, how deep do you go into the telcos uh, to make sure at least uh, you, you minimize the length on the last mile, how, how much uh, the data has to travel on the last mile and how much you can accelerate through. That's very important. Uh, personally speaking, as, as a member from the gaming community myself, it's frustrating, uh, like he rightly said, uh, even in urban cities, uh, you do not have the best networks always. And it's frustrating when you are in a com competitive scenario as a gamer and uh, you do not have uh, the right network to support you. Right. Uh, Mr. Nagpal, if you can hear me now, uh, your thoughts on this? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm so sorry. Uh, I was muted at that time, Kunil. Also, yeah, so as everyone rightly mentioned, I, I think that this is a, what the bigger role here is, I guess, uh, the intent to put, put, put out things and also uh, the intent to go ahead and do something which is out there and different with, uh, with respect to the growing environment and grow this particular space. So once that happen, happens, I'm pretty much sure that the technology that we have is sufficient, is suffice, is moving towards that a great space. Uh, so that won't be a problem as per se. And what we have also ob observed right now is that I was earlier mentioning this as well, that uh, there are brands who are keeping an eye on it. There is money which is going to flow. Once there's money, there are businesses, there are things which are happening at a very great space, at, at a very great pace. And uh, this thing will be definitely supported by the technology that we have right now. As uh, Viral also mentioned, as Manisha also mentioned, that the intent has to be right. Uh, and the rest things are, uh, I think, that pretty much taken care of. Right, right. Uh, Mr. R uh, Russell, I want to understand, uh, I mean, tech part of it. Uh, you have heard all the speakers. What are your thoughts? Yes, um, a lot of good feedback here. Um, one, one thing I would like to add is, is that one, one thing we've, we've learned here at Limelight Networks is that we, we can't be so um, competitive that we're not collaborative, right? So um, in order to provide our users with the best experience, um, sometimes we have to partner with telecoms, um, we have to um, partner with, with cloud providers. And when I say partner, we have to make right. sure that, um, that our data locations are close to theirs, right? So that um, as you're getting um, your data from the cloud, right, that, right. that we we can deliver it um, that last mile optimally. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that, you know, the pairing and the partnerships um, at that last mile are, are very important to continue um, improving our performance, um, especially in, in regions like yours in, in India, um, where, uh, again, you may not have the best um, mobile connectivity. Um, I would I would disagree. I don't know why people keep saying there isn't good connectivity in India. India has by far, hands down, the best mobile connectivity of almost anywhere in the world at the cheapest possible prices. I was in the U.S. in this December. I I was in I, I was between Portland and Seattle. I drive 15 miles off of the highway between Portland and Seattle, and I have no connectivity. <laughs> yeah, I have no problem. I'm streaming my Bollywood jams all night long. 20 miles from the national highway. India does not have this problem. There are pockets, obviously. Yeah. India has a problem of cheaper phones, mm -hmm. poorer phones, but networks are top class. And uh, we pay $2 a month to get 60 gigs of mobile data a month. Right? That. So it's just, I disagree with everybody. Mobile networks are fantastic here. What we really need help with is 
all of the technology providers are charging India the same global prices in US dollars. Now, why Amazon, I, 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 I don't know of any other rate, but Amazon published rates. They are charging us eight to 10 cents a gigabyte for data transfer. But on the flip side, my consume, my customer is not equally monetizable. So there is a disparity in how much money I spend and how much money I can make to be able to run a successful business model. So this is the real help we need from the technology providers that do what you have to do. I understand these things are very expensive to make, et cetera, et cetera. But you have to somehow do something to help regions that have lower monetization per customer to have cheaper rates. Because if I keep paying the same global rates, then I'm not getting funded like those guys, right? What, what a series A in the Bay Area is, is a series B here. So my, I don't have that much money to spend. So can you help me out that way? And you will consistently see the world's largest numbers for streaming in India because we have the population. So while our numbers are larger, our bandwidth requirements are larger, our unit costs are higher and our monetization per customer is lower. So we are in, in, in deep trouble here if we are charged the same rates as a US company is. Um, Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Please, please go and on. And I have one more. Sorry, connectivity is bad. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got a little. So, sorry, your voice dropped. I'm, I'm so, yeah, sorry, so I'm we're praising the network, but it just got dropped. I, I have a heart attack. Thank you very much. This is. Yeah, yeah no right. problem. But thank you very much uh, for having me. I have to drop off, unfortunately. Thank you, Mr. Mehta, for joining Thank us. You. Uh, you raised some very valid points. And I'll come to Mr. Cross uh, with those points. Uh, you heard them. You heard the concerns and the positives as well as the challenges. Tell us, uh, how do we solve this? Uh, give me the limelight perspective of how do we address these issues? So your audio is muted. Okay, so uh, what's clear is that you know the actual technologies are not a mystery. You know, from where CDNs are now and the private networks and so forth, we see five G coming. Um, edge Edge is going to become a big part of this as well to try to keep more of the game processing closer to users. So the uh, the technologies are not a mystery. What I'm hearing is that we have a business problem, not a technology problem. Right? It's a, it's a money. I see shaking, head shaking, yes, <laughs> Arjit, right? It's, it's a money and an investment problem. It's a business problem, not a technology problem. The technologies exist. If the, uh, you know, if, the money, if the money is put into it to expand the infrastructure and it's a mobile environment, we know what the technologies are. Invest, invest in it and it will come. You know, that's, right. that's the bottom line. And it's not the, the customers are known, right? You you have you have the customers, you have the users there, and they're begging for the connectivity to play. So it's I would call this a perfect storm. So you just have to add money, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Perfect. So um, uh, we will be going. We have one. I'll go ask one question, and then we go to the question and answers that we have received. Um, I want to go to you, Mr. Uh, um, Kurana. I want to start with you. Um, what are the broad trends uh, that uh, are you kind of, you know, you can see in the foreseeable future in, in the Indian gaming uh, industry uh, that would kind of define the industry? Broad trends, if you could tell me. Uh, gaming is becoming mainstream. That is the biggest trend that I would uh, like to bring the notice, Absolutely. as Manisha also said, because. Uh, I've been in gaming for, uh, I started my gaming career back in 99. So I'm, I'm an old guy in this uh, uh, webinar from time I've spent in the gaming per se. But uh, we used to every year, as I've been in this industry for almost 15 years. I took a break for just 10 years. We used to say next year is going to be the best year for uh, Indian gaming industry. But now I can say that 2020 has been the best year for the gaming industry. 
first time I can say with a very conviction that this has been the year that we have been talking since 99 that this year will come. That is one thing. Second thing, I think uh, uh, gaming has been accepted as a way of life even by non-gamers. Giving you a very small example in just 30 seconds, my wife who is not a gamer and she hates because my kid and myself are two great gamers in the house. But right now, since she's also stuck at home, he loves playing uh, Ludo on uh, Paytm First uh, Games platform. So she has also turned a gamer, of course, a casual gamer. But right now, my son only gets uh, scolded by her for an hour that he's playing too much, whereas it used to be for almost 23 hours uh, in the past. So acceptance of gaming as a way of life is another uh, trend which is there. And of course, for eSports, acceptability, legitimacy for eSports as a, uh, a, a sport per se, like we, right. of course, it can't be of the, I don't expect it to, to be of the same uh, way we look at cricket because, you know, India, cricket is a religion, not a sport for us. But acceptability of esports also as a sporting event is also being accepted by the industry uh, largely. So I think those are the three trends that I've seen and we'll see just increase on the numbers going on. Right. I will come to you, Mr. Uh, Paryani, uh, with your thoughts on the broad trends that will define the space. So mobile gaming, as we know, is going to be one of the largest uh, in the next coming years, followed by, I think, console. We're seeing a rise now. I expect, uh, you know, with PlayStation 5 and the new Xbox, India will hopefully get a decent amount of uh, users over there. And uh, we can see a growth over there, but the highest will definitely be in mobile network and having mobile games. That's where we've seen the biggest trends. And uh, we continue to... Uh, also have majority of our tournaments around those games and we're looking to now you know, we've seen the, sh the trend shift recently in the last three years as they mentioned it was right. a pc trend where dota and csgo were like the highest games in india with the most amount of concurrent users currently right. that's changed completely with the introduction to battle royale through right. games like free fire through PUBG. so these kind of games uh, the new format of gaming as well has opened up a new array of gamers so we can't even predict what kind of games are going to come back and come in the future. You know, uh, with new uh, technology, there'll be new formats and it'll be lead to a new array of gamers as well. So okay. but again, we see that and maybe augmented reality and VR could be also this year. Uh, in this decade, we'll see an exponential trend as well. Cool. Mr. Agarwal, your thoughts, quick thoughts. So if you look at it, I think uh, what is still elusive in gaming is the monetization. Right. And I think that that needs to get sorted. Uh, gamers, number of gamers, time spent and everything is fine. And uh, uh, the more multi the gaming becomes multiplayer, the more, you know, really kind of move towards uh, giving great experiences, the cost keeps increasing. So I think the monetization uh, has to really keep in pace with the cost. Otherwise, um, we, a lot of companies will find it very difficult to keep sustained on the growth and how to manage the costs, right? Uh, I think I, I go back to 15 years back where the award on OTT platforms, every streaming cost was more than the advertising revenues which you used to make. And I think uh, with, with the social multiplayer, huge amount of casual gamers, they're playing, and not kind of paying. Um, that's the, that's to be is a big solve which needs to be figured out. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Katie, I got quick thoughts on this. So you know, on the on the monetization side, I think Manish has already added. I think for from my perspective, from an esports perspective, the two things that are going to change is uh, Media companies, more and more companies are going to come in and, and uh, take media rights for esports in India. They are going to showcase uh, esports on their platforms. And as that happens, a corollary of that is more and more brands are now seeing that if they have to connect with youth, if they have to engage with youth, if they have to build a community and enjoy the benefits of loyalty and connect with the youth, Esports is going to be one of the primary uh, uh, drivers for that 
and hence both from a sponsorship and media rights perspective this industry is going to get the much needed fillip which regular sports has got in a lot of free in a lot of countries in different ways so whether it right. was baseball and and basketball and football in the us whether it was football in in europe whether it was cricket in india this the for e sports to become mainstream it will be driven largely by media companies and brands alike perfect i will come to with the rest of the questions uh, there's a, a small presentation by mr cross and then i would come to all of you uh, mr cross uh, you can start your presentation okay i'll share my screen and uh, i'll go very quickly through the um, very quickly through the data here because i don't think any of this is going to be a surprise to to anyone so i'll skip the all right so you So nothing new. Mobile's primary. We, we've all said that. Um, frustration by slow game downloads and, and interruptions. We've talked about that as well. Um, watching others play video games. So a lot of the data you're going to see, this is how much, I just want to reinforce how much more things are happening in India than the rest of the world. So on average, twice as many hours per week than any other countries, just watching, watching esports. Um, but they still watch, well, not now, but before the pandemic, they still watch traditional sports on television twice as many hours as people in other countries. You know, not, obviously not true today, but that was, that was the case before. Uh, we'll see what happens on the other side when esports or when traditional sports are playing without people in stadium and starting to show that. We'll see if that continues. Um, fast performance is very important. And then simple gameplay is second. This is, this is a big, huge thing. They, everybody wants fast performance. Um, in fact, gaming so popular that a large 30% of people, they play daily at work, uh, at least a little bit of time. You know, they, they can't help themselves. Um, and somebody had talked about how so many more players in India want to become professionals. They, they want to do that. So yeah, 53% in the survey, and this is again, the highest of any other country, if, if they could support themselves by being a professional, they would. And uh, interfering with daily activity. So uh, this is really funny when I look at this across country. So, you know, missing work, it's, that's fairly typical. Missing time to socialize, sure. Uh, gamers are famous for missing sleep, you know, playing deep into the night. Um, miss taking a shower. Missing a meal, this is really funny because in two countries, France and Italy, this is a very low number because I think in those two countries, eating is maybe more important than in most other places. So I thought that was, that was funny that, that they, they don't miss meals, but everything else is the same. Um, and I just want to show that it, this, is, this kind of uh, popularity of these games, it, it goes across everything, all these types of games. So it's not just the, some of the big ones. Multiplayer, single player, shooter games, role play, you know, all these types of games are, are extremely popular. And, um, you know, they spend over four hours a week, um, twice as many, again, as all other countries doing these things. So watching traditional sports or watching esports tournaments, watching other people play, just the watching side, never mind even the, the playing side, extremely popular. And I think it's the, the final one. Um, the console is gaming. So when I think of things like uh, Google Stratia, you know, trying to get more cloud gaming. Um, you know, there's, there's some issues now around performance and latency with some of these games. It's, it's improving, but it's, it's going to be really, really important um, to solve these problems and get a lot of the gameplay localized as much as possible to avoid this problem. But most of the people would subscribe uh, when, if a service was offered in their part of the world. Um, they all expect high performance. Uh, you know, that, if the performance isn't good, they won't subscribe. Um, and also, but the cost has to be, it can't be very expensive. So it has to be high performance and it has to be performant. Um, given a choice, 
watch a movie or play a video game. 70% they'd rather play a video game. You know, I, I don't think any of this is a surprise to people here. So I'm gonna let Ernest go through some use cases. Ernest, do you wanna share your screen or do you want me to just um, drive for you? Yeah, we, we'll go through this quickly. So if you could just um, advance for me. Um, yep. And thank so you, on, Charlie. Yep, we're on, we're we're on, on the use cases. Say again? Yes. Yes. So yeah, thank you for covering that data. And, and for our viewers out there, um, our, our online gaming um, report is available online. Um, so I just want to um, kind of put it in context here. Now, this isn't all inclusive, but these are, are some of the, the popular use cases um, that we see as a CDN um, and, and help our customers with. Um, one of the biggest um, needs is, is gaming file downloads, right? And, and the need um, not just to, to deliver um, your, your game um, to your users, um, but to be able to um, deliver um, in remote regions, to be able to um, deliver at scale and, and with, with good performance. Um, and then the next use case we have is, is the game streaming platforms, right? So these are our platforms for downloading and sharing games, um, and a lot of interactivity there, right? And so um, we wanna provide tools um, that allows the gamers to, to interact. And um, one of the best things for interaction is low latency. Right, because that that delay um, between video can can cause that awkwardness. Right, so latency, um, then then we in, increase interactivity. And then uh, we have um, esports and gaming tournaments, um, which we we've already mentioned here is is increasing in in uh, both popularity and and size. Um, and so. Um, with with CDN, we don't particularly help with with on site, right? And in, in a lot of these esports tournaments, the the gamers are are on site to um, provide that equal playing field. Um, where the CDN um, more helps with is is the delivery of that, right? And and the millions of viewers um, that are enjoying um, these these esport esport tournaments. Uh, and then the, the final case, uh, use case we'll take a look at here is um, one of the newest is the console-less gaming, right? And, and some of the challenges there are, are, are similar where um, we're, we're still delivering large files and data. Um, um, also, we are, um, we're integrating more interactivity, controls, um, and, it, and especially in um, in your region, we're seeing um, mobile first development, right, being, being very important um, and making sure that um, our users on, on phones and tablets um, are getting an optimal experience. So we'll go to the next slide here. All right, so um, in, in the video game download challenges, um, the, the key is we want to um, achieve better performance, reducing um, interruptions, but in particularly on the next slide here um, is we, you'll see that um, most, most prefer to acquire their video game by downloading it, right? Especially with the store shut down, right? Instead of buying a physical copy or renting a copy, um, a lot of them are downloading. We see here over 63% prefer to download their games. Right, and the the thing that they're most frustrated with isn't interruptions, or it isn't that um, the download didn't work, but it's the length that it takes um, for the initial download, right? Because they're they're anxious, they're excited um, to to start playing the new game or patch. Go to the next slide, uh, and so for gaming streaming platform challenges. Um, slightly different, and, and again, these, these may overlap some. Um, but we, um, for game streaming platforms, um, we need to, to scale um, content delivery, right? Um, and, and again, the, the low latency um, video enabled a, enables us to increase interaction, right? Um, and so um, here at Limelight, we, um, we have chunk streaming, um, tune chunk streaming. So we have um, ways that we can reduce latency um, to increase um, user interactivity. 
And um, I just want to highlight um, one of our customers here, um, Nintendo Europe. Um, we, we were able um, to, um, to help Nintendo Europe um, with their site and, and really, um, really in, increase performance. Um, and the, the challenge they have is, is that they have um, a lot of videos, on, video on demand videos um, that they needed to be able to manage um, to be able to um, store on their website and deliver anywhere with the performance that that we all expect from their their video games, right? So we were able to um, use our video platform to um, to manage their video on demand. Um, we um, we were able to apply player branding so that um, you know to get the the look and feel that they desired within the site. Um, we were able to, to optimize their video storage and transcoding, making sure um, that all the videos were in, in proper format for, um, for the various devices that they were delivering to. Um, and um, the, the things I want to, to highlight most um, is the last few, right? That, the, again, the mobile device detection, um, optimizing video to, um, to each device, and global scale. Um, again, Nintendo being a large global company, um, they wanted to make sure that they're getting optimal performance um, wherever the viewer is. Next slide, please. All right, and we're almost through here. And so um, just wanted to talk a little bit uh, more about the eSport challenges, um, which uh, again, is, it's more of, and, and this is where I think uh, CDN really strives is that uh, to us this isn't any different um, than you know than cricket or, or World Cup um, when when we're delivering video out to the many users right and so we um, again most of the players are on site so so where our help is needed is making sure that um, that that e-tournament video reaches your users um, with with good performance low buffering and uh, low start times next slide uh, and so now, last, let's talk about consoleless gaming challenges, which, um, which is one of the newer and slightly different, right? Because it's not just um, the the viewer watching, right? It's um, there's a new challenge here in in being able to scale real time applications, um, being able to um, perform, you know, user control um, over the web. And that's, that's really where we get into the benefit of, of moving compute to the edge um, for, for better performance, um, making decisions at the edge, um, and also um, keeping that, that mobile first um, development mindset um, to make sure that all of our users, regardless of platform, are, are receiving a good experience. And okay, I want to close here um, with um, some security. Um, so um, we we all want to make sure that we we protect our our gaming infrastructure, right? And that's across all channels: website, mobile, and um, our our API or application programming interface. Next slide. And so, oh, we. We lost the slide deck there, Charlie, but I, but I can, right. um, no problem, I, I can um, continue here. And so um, some of the things that, um, the ways we offer protection are in the same ways we offer protection um, for our video services um, with our web application firewall, um, our protection um, from, from DDoS attacks, um, and, um, and, actual, and also our, our API um, security, right? So again, we want to make sure that we're, we're protected and we're secured across um, all platforms. Perfect. And Thank you so much. I'm sorry, sorry, yes. we have more to add here. Please, please go on. <laughs> yes, no, I, I, um, I wanted to wrap up there, but I think it's a good time to, um, to interject some, some questions. Um, yes. yes. Yes, perfect. So I, uh, we have uh, five minutes, so I want to quickly go to Mr. Mathur. Uh, so this is a question from Prati Kadam, a very relevant question. I'll, I'll come to others also. What are the best possible ways to make brands believe that investing in these sports is beneficial for getting their brand vision out there? Um, 
could you just repeat that, please? Uh, what are the best possible ways to ma make brands believe that investing in esports is beneficial? <laughs> See, uh, um, honestly, the uh, I'll talk about the real money gaming market now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So honestly, the real money gaming market is uh, is the most monetizable market right now. Mm. You know, uh, if if you talk uh, if you talk about casual gaming, then casual gaming in in casual gaming, the uh, uh, I mean the paying customers are probably of the tune of 0.1 percent to one percent. Right. In the real money gaming aspect, the the entire uh, business model is based on uh, you know the uh, the rate or commission that you charge from the user. So, right. in 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 these uh, you, uh, you know uh, um, because of this uh, uh, because of this what we uh, I mean what the advertisers or what the uh, uh, investors should see is that you know this is the area where actually the money can be made and the return on investment could be there. Right. Right. So that is. Probably the biggest uh, pull for them. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I want to come to you, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? How do we, uh, how can brands, you know, see more value in uh, esports? Well, uh, it's a very simple thing, actually. Uh, we always, when we go for any kind of business deal, we should look at the point who is not our customer rather than who is our customer. So as a brand, when you go for any kind of uh, new genre, they usually go for that first question. Am I audible? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. So when you go for that kind of filterization model, any brand, any decent brand, they will filter out who is not their consumer. They are not looking for users. They're certainly looking for people who are buyers. So as an esports industry, when you... Uh, roping those brands who are looking for mileage, who are looking for selling their products. I guess that's the kind of filterization model uh, we should come up with, wherein we can say, you know what, these are the filtered consumer base for you. And these are the kind of market size for you. And this is the kind of per percentage you can grab it. So if those kind of structure is there in front of them, I don't feel that that, uh, you know, people will, uh, uh, shake again their head that I shouldn't invest into esports. And in fact, uh, apart from India, there are multiple kind of investment that's happening. I can go on with Russia. Australia. I'll, 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 I'm sorry, sorry. I have to cut it short. I will just give you another opportunity. So my role being taken by panelists, we have three speakers here from Limelight. Do you have any questions for them, uh, Mr. Bhattacharya and everybody else? We have three more minutes to go. To Mr. Cross, to Mr. Russell, to Mr. Sharma. I missed your question. I mean, missed the missed the question. Uh, so we have Mr. Russell, Mr. Cross, Mr. Sharma from uh, the Limelight Networks. Any questions for them from the panelists directly? You can ask them. Oh, super! I mean, uh, I'm all in Please for I'm all in for uh, shaking hands with with all of you. So like. It's open. Please, please go ahead. If you have any question, we have uh, oh, another two minutes. I, I have a question. I mean, uh, uh, from a CDN, you know, uh, 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 provider, a, uh, a serious player there. How how are you? You know, how do you place yourself uh, as compared to you know AWS CloudFront or other you know such uh, CDN players in this business? Uh, who is this address to, Mr. Cross or Ms. Cross or uh, Russell? I mean, uh, please. Yeah, Charlie. It looks like uh, you're on mute, Charlie, but it looks like he has an answer to that one. Yep. Sorry about that. Um, I'm a terrible mute person. Um, uh, so, so the AWS we look at as we call cooperation, because yes, they have CDN services, but also uh, a lot a lot of our customers use AWS storage. So we we find that even we have CDN storage as well, but we find a huge number of our customers use AWS storage. So they're a, in a way they're a partner. We have APIs so that we make it easy to exchange data with AWS and the CDN. Um, and and you know our businesses are different. You know in terms of the services we offer compared to AWS, there's their platform is you, you can you can sort of create your own CDN with the different softwares they have. And, but since it was a different business model, we try to be more 
white glove. We have all the different services and we help you and so forth. So it's a, it's a cooperation kind of scenario. Yes, any more questions on tech side of it? Ruel, if we don't have uh, a direct question, I would like to make a comment on yeah, something yeah, please, that was asked please. earlier. I think uh, one big takeaway that I was hearing through across the discussion today was that the pain point is more, uh, more than tech is on the business side. Uh, the industry has a big challenge on monetization and they want uh, vendors, they want partners who can work with them to help them on reduce costs uh, in this in this phase, right? And when I heard a statement, it said that we got off the shelf rates that are US rates being sold um, in India. It, uh, it seems to me that the infrastructure uh, side of this table has not really understood the potential perhaps of how big this uh, industry is going to be in India. And it seems like a great opportunity to sit together and work together on something on, on those lines. I think we did, we had the same phase with ODT and video coming up uh, many years ago. And uh, the solution lies with uh, the gaming service providers and the infrastructure providers who are who are going to support them to sit together, figure out where the cost lies. Uh, like, uh, from, from a distance, it looks like a per GB rate and that's what you have to pay. But there are things that go behind that to actually, uh, that build up to that cost. And there are optimizations that can be done to reduce that cost by working together. For instance, the size of the object that you deliver uh, has a big impact for a CDN on what cost comes out. And that's something mm. that two partners can sit together and really work out. So it sounds like a very interesting opportunity for the two industries to sit together and uh, figure out to make this a profitable business for everyone. Yeah. Mr. Bhattacharya, you want to ask something? Sorry. I guess we are uh, actually uh, good to go. I mean, uh, from my end, there is okay. a question. Yes, Mr. Savkar, I, I can see you. Oh, no, sorry, I have a hard stop, so I wanted to drop off. Thanks for having me. Perfect. I will uh, officially sum it up and say thank you to all of you for this wonderful conversation uh, wherein we brought out some gold mine of information that can be used by all the players. Thank you so much for joining us and hope to see you soon in a, another live event, maybe at the live event. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much.